y'all, Carolyn here. Today I'm going to be talking about recreating heavily embellished ornate gowns. Um, the type of gowns that you know you cannot make in a week no matter how fast you sew. Uh, the type of gowns that can take months, even years to complete uh, where you have to recreate yardage or yards of trim. Um, I'm going to gear this towards embroidered and beaded gowns, but um, hopefully there's a lot you can take away from this video in regards to all kinds of sewing. So, you know, planning, budgeting, deadlines, uh, motivation, and uh, finding the discipline to see these projects through. So um, we'll show and tell first. These are some of my more ambitious, time-consuming gowns. Each one either has some kind of embroidery or beading or some aspect of the gown besides the construction that took a lot of time and planning. Um, I really enjoy doing garments like this. Um, they're, they're time consuming, they're long term, they take patience, they take major dedication, but um, they're also, there's some great pros in that once you plan out one of these garments, you can cruise off of that work for months. So uh, you got one mock-up, just like any outfit, you know, you got your planning, but then you get to actually enjoy the sewing for like 10 times longer than most projects. But um, here I've got some embroidery, wove trim for this one, gold work on these sequins and broad plate, um, applique by machine, applique by hand, and uh, tambour beading. Um, so these are some of my more successful recent projects that I am going to be referring to a lot today. So hopefully you can learn from my trials and errors and it will make the path to recreating a similar garment easier for someone else who wants to try. And um, you're gonna have to forgive me because I've got plenty of notes here and I want to I want to get you the information without having to memorize an hour's worth of video. Alrighty. So first things first, the ornate gowns and garments we're accustomed to seeing in museums and online. These garments were not made by one person sewing at home as a hobby. Um, like the turn of the century Worth gowns and Doucet, those were made by professional embroiderers. The yardage was made. And then they were constructed by professional dressmakers and more than one of each. So, not one person at home. Also, like 18th century gowns with lots of embroidery, a lot of that work was imported from India from places where embroidery was the area's trade for export and then they would be constructed generally by a professional dressmaker manteau maker for a client um, so when we as historical costumers take on a gown of this magnitude we're not taking on a historically accurate challenge. We're taking on something far more difficult because we're the ones making the yardage and we're the ones constructing the garment and we're the ones wearing it, um, which is generally not a process that was seen throughout history. Um, most people had gowns made for them. Now, there are some examples of um, embroidered garments that were homemade but this is generally not the rule, especially with like the, the gowns I have behind me. These were not originally homemade gowns, and most of them are based off of a garment from history. Um, so keep that in mind. <laughs> Don't beat yourself up because this is, um, it's a process to finish one of these gowns, especially solo. So your first question when Trump, trying to recreate something of this magnitude. Do you have a deadline or not? So if you don't have a deadline, we'll get to that down the way. But if you do have a deadline, um, when do you need your costume by? 
So you got to think, how many hours a week can you truly commit to working toward the garment? Um, you need to assess this honestly because overestimating, it's just going to bring you heartache. Do you have a couple hours a week or a couple hours a day? Um, even if you have the time, are you willing to devote that time to a monotonous task like embroidering um, where it's over and over hours of the same thing? If that's not your jam, you don't have to recreate something like this. this is, it's got to be something you want to do, something you love for the sake of doing it. Um, if you have that time to commit, does it leave you enough time for the rest of your life, for your other interests? Um, does it leave you enough time for other sewing projects? Um, I find that when I'm working on any of these garments that are long-term, I like to make sure I have enough time to still make a blouse or if, a, if an event comes up, I can make a costume for it, something simple. Um, so you don't feel like you're chained to one project. Um, does it realistically leave you enough free time for everything else you do? You know, doing things with your family, exercising, reading, watching TV, um, going on vacation. Like you want to be able to do your normal life and not just only devote your time to a project. And this is hard if you're on a deadline because sometimes you're so motivated and you just want to you want to get it done, you want to make it happen, but you don't want the rest of your life to suffer. So you have to honestly assess going into deciding on a deadline if it's possible. Um, so, okay, you have like five hours a day to devote to this. Just, you have like all this time, it's great. Um, can your body keep up? So even if you have the free time, and let's say every evening you want to work on this from, you know, six o'clock to midnight. Working on embroidery is astoundingly hard on your body. Not only perhaps are you hunching over, kind of like when you're on the computer and you're hunched down and you put pressure on your back, um, though you should have your embroidery frame adjusted to the correct height that's best for you to work on. Um, it's hard on your arms, hovering as you sew, as you timbre. It's, your shoulders get tired, your arms get tired. Um, see on this embroidery, I have paper towels here um, so I can actually rest my arms as I work. And you're not ruining the fabric. And this is common, you can do this with tissue, it's, it's a thing. Um, but it is hard on your body. It's hard on your eyes. If you're gonna be working in the evenings or in a darker room, you need to make sure you have light. Um, these are all things to consider before um, delving in and saying you're going to get something done by a deadline. So once you come up with an estimate with how many hours a day, a week, a month, whatever, you can work, um, that you can devote to this, um, is it enough time to complete the garment by your deadline? So there are some ways of estimating how long a garment is going to take. If you've already made a garment from that particular era, you have some idea of how long it takes you to make the base garment. And every one of the dresses you see that are heavily embroidered, beaded, pleated, lace, they all start as a base shape. They're all a basic bodice and skirt, generally depending on the era. Um, what makes them time consuming is all the extra handwork and embellishment that goes into them. So some ways to estimate how long that handwork is going to take. You can make swatches. Um, if you're embroidering a repeat, you can make a repeat of that, or you can make one repeat of that embroidery. So like I could do one square on this embroidery and see how long it takes. Or on this, one flower. And after you've planned out and sketched out your plan, you can count and see, okay, is this possible? there's a, a way you can get a ballpark. Um, if you have pleating or trim, uh, take some paper, pleat it up like you're expecting, make a foot of it, see how long it takes you. Um, with this trim, it was um, woven, 
I made a yard and then I was able to figure out about how long that took. Um, and then when you start in on embroidery, whether you're new to it or not, you're going to get faster as the repeats go by and generally everything is a repeat of embroidery. Um, it's very rare to see something that's like completely freehand, maybe like some vermicelli embroidering and you know in the 20s or something but it, pretty much everything is sketched out in advance and a repeat which makes it easier to work on um, as you go through these you're gonna get faster and more proficient but you have to be realistic also and don't assume you're gonna get you know five times as fast so whatever however long it takes you to do one repeat assume that's about how long it's gonna take you and um, overestimating is better than underestimating how much time you need also, speaking of embroidery, do you have the space for something like this? Um, embroidery frames take up a lot of room. This is actually one of my smaller frames. Um, this beaded gown, the it was stretched out um, for timbre, which takes a lot of room. One panel, so the front panel and the back panel, one panel was took about the size of a dining room table. <laughs> And I was able to like stand it up against a wall to get it out of the way, but you're living with this for potentially months. So you have got to make sure you have room or that you can rig up a frame in such a way that it can be broken down. When I worked on this, I used a quilt frame, which wasn't ideal. I've learned a lot since then, um, but it was a scrolling quilt frame. It was about six feet across and it opened to about four feet wide, three feet wide. Um, but I was able to take off the scrolling parts, roll them up so I had two long sticks rolled in fabric and I'd wrap them in a sheet and kind of tuck them in the corner. But I still had the the bottom half of that table, you know, to put in my house. And I have a sewing room um, dedicated, but it still, it still takes up a lot of space. So that is something to take into account. You can use a, a hoop for some projects, um, like these embroidered 1920s dresses over here, you can't really see them, but they're just, uh, they were timbre embroidered as my practice timbre to start the beading on this gown. Um, those I was able to do in a hoop because of the fabric and the type of embroidery it was. Um, hoops are not ideal, especially for lots of yardage, but they are definitely small. And um, depending on your fabric, they can be fine. And they're definitely your smallest option. Uh, but they can, the hoop itself can leave marks on your fabric or pull it. So you 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 really want a properly sized frame that you can adjust and work with and that you're not constantly having to move the hoop um, unless it does work for your project. Um, this one is my favorite itineration of a homemade embroidery frame and I use clamps and wood from Lowe's and I will definitely do a video on how I do this soon but um, the nice thing about it is it can be completely taken apart completely taken down um, and then reassembled as needed so really good for saving space and cheaper um, there are similar embroidery frames you can buy like this and they just uh, they can be really expensive and really flimsy. So I tend to make all mine now. And I will absolutely share how I do that soon. So also, perhaps you're thinking, well, if it takes up so much room, why do I even need an embroidery frame? You can get away with some things with no frame, but I'm telling you, especially when you're working on multiple yardage, it makes your life so much easier. A proper a properly tensioned embroidery frame it will keep all your fabric taut and flat um, same tension as your stitching so you won't get pulling you won't take um, too tight of stitches if you're embroidering it keeps everything smooth and flat and um, it just it helps you sew so much faster um, another thing uh, oh something particular to me I travel a lot so I like all these things to be um, portable and except this gown 
everything I worked on, this gown not also, this was done mostly on the machine, but so except for these two gowns, every other one of these I was able to take as I traveled, uh, whether road trip or even on the airplane, um, depending on the size of the hoop and embroidery. So that is a big consideration um, for space and um, so that you have you can use all maximum time to work on these things. <sighs> okay, so if you have the time, you have the space, budget. And this is hard. Um, a lot of times we only think of your fashion fabric being what you need to worry about for a budget. But trim, lining materials, um, mock-up materials on a, a gown sized project yards and yards of material is it can really add up so you really want to take all these things into account before you commit to purchasing parts of your materials because you don't want to be stuck with half a gallon's worth of material and then you're you, you can't you don't have the money to purchase the rest and then you're you've wasted you can always sell material at the end, but it's it, you're never gonna get what you bought it for, generally. So, um, lining fabrics, mock-up fabric, thread. Thread adds up, especially if you're um, gonna be using a specialty thread like silk. Um, I was actually able to save a lot of money on this gown. Um, I assumed I would have to sew on, because everything is silk, silk tool, silk satin everything um i was assuming i would have to sew the sequins on with silk i know that you can see these are all all sequins um luckily i tried this i did a test swatch and the silk thread did not have the um it was too slick and so i did maybe a yard of work and all the sequins started falling off because the knots were coming undone so luckily, it was before I'd gone out and bought a ton of silk thread, I was able to just use cotton. Perfect. Um, and you can, I mean, it, it's all its all relative what's important to you, but you can save a lot of money not buying silk thread. Um, my only suggestion is go for cotton, not polyester. Um, polyester thread is very, um, very strong and can be difficult to work with, especially with delicate fabrics. Uh, okay, the, taking this one again as an example, the material themselves, the embroidery material, the, um, the sequins, these add up like crazy. Same with the beads. Um, assume you're going to need so much more than you initially think and plan accordingly. Um, with both these projects, I haven't quite figured out a good way to estimate uh, how many beads you may need so I had to keep rebuying them and this wasn't too big of a deal this gown I did over a year so I was able to keep purchasing slowly slowly over the year and I used just cheap regular synthetic sequins um, I wanted to do metal but it was way way out of my budget I needed almost 30,000 sequins for this um, and this I used some very good quality beads and was able to make it work because it's a smaller garment but um, some ways you can kind of deal with this potential problem you can try to come up with some kind of estimate but my suggestions would be either definitely buy too much which is not the ideal option but if you're working with maybe vintage beads or something else in bulk that you're only gonna have the opportunity to buy once make sure you get enough because you don't want to get halfway through a garment with vintage beads and you run out so if you are working with a vintage material like that maybe find a modern alternative as a backup plan so if you run out you have more to work with um, also purchasing something that can be repurchased over time 
uh, like these sequins, I found them on Amazon, and they were, um, I, I was able to buy them over and over throughout the year. Uh, these beads were Miyuki Delicas, and um, they make the same beads, you're able to rebuy them. Um, that's very important because you don't want to get halfway through your project and run out of material. Um, if you do overbuy, um, you can, you can't really return because a lot of these garments will take months and I've never found somewhere you could return months later. But um, you can always sell your leftover bags of material on Etsy, on eBay, donate them, save them for a future project. That's a personal, personal thing. Um, let's see. The needing to repurchase materials uh, goes beyond embellishment materials. Um, when you're working on something of large yardage, it's always a good idea to be able to repurchase your fabric as well. Um, I know this is often not possible, but my advice on this would be when you get your fabric, make sure you have enough of it, make sure you have a little extra, and double check it. When I was making this white gown, the underskirt is a silk duchess satin, and it was maybe seven or eight yards, and I purchased the yardage and set it aside, you know, no problems from somewhere I'd purchased many times before, never had a problem. And months later, it's time to make, after I'd finished all the beading, it's time to make the skirt. Pull it out, and it was streaked in yellow. Like, there was a flaw in the fabric, because um, it had been in the plastic bag it came in the whole time. Um, and all the way through, not just on the fold, it wasn't like something that happened once I got it. And I contacted the company and they said, sorry, you know, it's, you've had this for, you know, six months. Like, how do we know it was our problem? Which is unfortunate, but um, learn from my mistake. Check your fabric immediately and check you have enough of it. Um, I like to overbuy my fabric a little bit just in case you ever have to mend the garment, alter the garment. When you're, when you're working with these kind of materials anyway, you don't want to skimp like get the extra yard, get the extra half yard. Um, it will make your life so much easier in the end if you need to recut a piece. Um, these are not, the, this is why you have to plan these gowns out. You can't just kind of go with the wind on them because you can, you can really, it can really be inconvenient if you run out of material or ruin something and then have no way of fixing it when you've already spent so much time on them. Um, also in regards to checking your fabric ahead of time, decide in advance how you're going to launder your dress, garment, whatever you're making. Um, most of these were never meant to be washed. Throughout history they were not meant to be washed. Um, they were meant to be spot cleaned, brushed, uh, things like that. You just, you just can't wash them. There are, that's why you see, um, especially like 19th century, you'll see like wash dresses, like Edward, more Edwardian, you'll see things um, advertised in catalogs as like wash dresses because they're meant to be able to be laundered completely. Um, I had a problem, again, with this dress um, that yardage that was ruined, I, before I went and repurchased eight yards of silk satin, I decided to try dry cleaning it. Now, I wasn't intending on dry cleaning the dress ever, but I thought, why not? What if the yellow comes out? Well, this has only happened with a couple of silks that I've dry cleaned. It completely lost its finish. Um, it was the the fabric was totally ruined. So if you are ever planning on dry cleaning a garment or washing it by hand, test a swatch of your fabric ahead of time. Um, this especially I find happens with 
um, satin finish silks and um, I've noticed crepe to chin has a tendency to shrink and I've noticed color change on um, a charmeuse so try this ahead of time on a small swatch then you can know if you are able to pre-wash your fabric or pre-dry clean so you know in the future you can or can't launder it and that goes for pretty much anything you make like do the test swatch first all right so other budgeting compromises so I mentioned using synthetic sequins on this gown and um, cotton thread instead of silk for the overlay um, some other things you can save money on are the lining materials. Um, these two gowns both have silk taffeta lining, as did the gowns they were modeled off of. However, that's very expensive. You could always substitute your lining with something that will behave similarly, like perhaps a polished cotton, which is historically used for linings because it's sleek, it doesn't catch on your clothes. Um, it doesn't hold dirt the same way if you use it for hem facing. Um, it's it's slick. It's not porous. Um, I wouldn't recommend mixing natural and synthetic fabrics together unless you really have to. Um, they can react and make static, uh, especially wool with um, synthetics but definitely worth consideration if you're thinking, oh, let me line my dress in a synthetic taffeta. Um, generally, you're better off going with another natural fiber. Um, that being said, if you do not have the budget for a silk that you want and you want to recreate a gown that was silk, there is absolutely nothing wrong with recreating a garment out of synthetic silk. This, this um, chine a la branche, sort of, oh man, you can't even see it. Maybe you can kind of see it. Um, it's a warp printed taffeta, and I bought it because I've never been able to find a true silk warp printed taffeta, first of all, really at all but in my budget because I've, I've seen it for like oh man like 150 bucks a yard and I wanted it so bad but um but this is a, a silk blend um I'm actually I have suspicions that it's not silk at all but you know I love that gown so it's fine um but don't let don't let a thought that you have to make it out of silk stop you from trying to recreate one of these gowns if you want um, the same year I made this gown at Costume College, Gina White of um, her Instagram is the House of White. She made a beautiful, I think it was an 1890s worth recreation, um, a pink gown with clouds and um, beaded in pearls all in the front of the skirt. Gorgeous dress. Um, and I watched her make it. I, we took pictures together at Costume College. It was just fantastic. And I didn't even realize until I heard her in a um, an interview with Lauren of Wearing History, I had no idea that the dress was made out of synthetic silk. I never in a million years would have guessed, and it looked perfect. Um, so don't let that don't let that scare you off. Um, if you if if real silk isn't in your budget, or if it's a fabric you can't find in real silk like this one, or or you just find a, a synthetic that you like. Um, don't be afraid. Like, don't let people scare you off from it's. It's not real. Um, go for it. Um, so, next up, your next hurdle is skill set. Now, what motivates me to remake dresses like this is I want to learn how to do it. For this gown, I learned tambour beading. Um, I don't know if I really learned anything. It was 
an exercise in applique stitch. The, um, all the silk and lace where it meets is all hand applique. Um, but this, this gown, I had to learn how to machine applique because I do a lot by hand and I didn't know how to do that. This gown was, I learned how to embroider sequins, I don't know. This was fun, I got to learn how to weave trim. And these two were um, my timbre embroidery practice for that dress. This, I have learned how to um, work with flat metal plate, which is a bit different because it kinks and twists if you're not careful. But my point, the whole reason I like recreating these is I want to learn. And I've had to learn a new skill for each garment. Um, and that's my motivation for wanting to do this. However, you see a gown you want to recreate, there's probably something you have to learn, some technique to teach yourself to be able to accomplish it. If you're on a deadline, this can be a little hard, but um, you can practice on a small scale, see how you like it. As I said, I started simple with the timbre embroidery to be able to get to the beading because um, that probably would have been a lot to, to do all at once, like the coordination of the tambour needle as well as feeding the beads. Anyway, um, so you can practice first, you can make swatches, or you can just dive in and start slow. You can start um, like in a weird corner of the dress that's not going to be super obvious. So that by the time you get around to the front or the more focal parts of the gown, um, your stitches are proficient enough that you're happy with them. And then anything that was a little wobbly is tucked away in some fold that no one will ever notice. Um, like this, like my first couple of yards of weaving this was a little funky, but it's, you know, I didn't put it on the center front of the gown either. Um, this one I started at kind of like the back bottom corner. Um, Uh, this one, I think I didn't start right in the center of the dress with the beading. I probably started kind of down on the side somewhere. That's always a good thing to do. Um, now, if you want to recreate a gown and you try to learn a technique for it and you either don't like it or don't think you're proficient enough at it, but you still want to make the dress, let's say for a deadline, like an event coming up, um, there are some compromises you can make. Uh, this gown is a good example of that. I, in the end, I did end up going with the, the real way it was done. It's some um, metal strips. Here's, I don't know if you can really see, it's a strip. It's metal strips that are embroidered in cotton. And um, before I decided to go crazy and do all the yardage for this particular gown. I spent probably the better part of a decade trying to figure out how to hack it. Um, I did end up going with this in the end because I was able to find the correct embroidery material and then after this gown I was like I can I can do this it's fine. But my other options had been printed fabric. Um, I had looked at Spoonflower like designing a similar fabric. I don't really have the computer skills for this or machine embroidery, but those are both really good options if you're good at that. Um, if you're more hands-on, you could draw or paint the fabric. Um, there's some beautiful gowns um, throughout history, like especially um, 18th century and Regency gowns that are actually inked or painted. That is an option and that actually could have, I mean, this is 18th century embroidery, could potentially have worked um, if you're willing to kind of bend, bend your own rules a little bit. Um, different kind of embroidery. This is extremely time consuming because of working with the flat metal and not letting it kink or twist or bend weird. Um, timbre. Had I done this in timbre embroidery, I would have been done with the gown already. <laughs> um, and that could have that that could have been used then. So. If you're willing to stray from the original garment, if you're if you are following an original garment, 
Um, there's definitely other options that could be faster, more fun for you. Um, you can also outsource your embroidery to a professional, either uh, someone who does machine embroidery or um, like I met someone through Instagram while working on this who actually has a workshop in India that does professional traditional embroidery. And um, if you're willing to pay and wait for that to be done, it's, it's, that's a great option if you're on a deadline. Um, now, if the, let's say the embroidery is the fun part to you, but you're going to run out of time to do the rest of the garment exactly how you want, perhaps you can compromise by machine sewing the interior seams. Um, or not finishing them as finely as perhaps you you wanted to originally. And you can always go back. I've taken gowns apart that I've made early on, completely taken them apart and hand sewn them back together. Um, there's a chintz gown that I made that's like a 1780s chintz gown. And it was one of the very first gowns I made when I got into historical costuming. And the fabric was lovely and worthy of a place and I was not happy with how I stitched the garment. I took it apart and redid it to my current abilities. All right. Um, planning. So you've got your budget sorted, you've got your deadline sorted, you've got um, skills worked out, um, how much time you can work. Next step is the planning of the garment. I shouldn't say next step because actually you should probably plan early on, but next step in my notes is the planning. So how I plan for deadlines, first things first, I make like a blueprint of the gown. I completely sketch out all that I want to do. I make notes about how I'm going to close the garment, how I'm going to finish the seams, how I'm going to finish the hem. Um, if it has embellishment, does the embellishment need to be done first? Or perhaps it's like this gown where the pleating and um, weaving, woven trim was added on after the garment was finished. Um, can you so are seams going to intersect that you need to leave embroidery um, not finished at the end so that you can make them match 100%? Um, all these things, all the layers, all the underwear, all the accessories, the order in which I need things, I plan all this out and sketch it all out first. So it's basically like a blueprint to follow. Um, I like this because if I've accounted for all these things in advance, I'm going to have less chance of surprises along the way. Um, if I already know how things are gonna close, um, in what order seams need to be sewn, there's much less opportunity for um, problems as I go. So once I have this blueprint done, I, I look at the amount of time I have. So let's say you have a year, which is somewhat realistic considering we have annual events. So like costume college when I made this gown. Costume college ended, went home, did my thing for about a month, and then I said, oh, I want to make this gown for next year. I have basically a year. Planned it out, and then wrote down like what month I needed what by, and then I divided all the tasks that I'd need to finish the gown within those months, leaving an extra month free. So I had like 11 months. I accounted for 10. So that way you have a whole extra month in case anything goes wrong. Um, some things go faster than, than you expect and I was able to cross things off the list and I was able to take a few months off of this gown, uh, traveling, just doing other stuff, enjoying the holidays. Um, but because I knew what I needed to finish and I had that written down and I was able to cross it off, 
I was able to work easily and in a relaxed way, not like three months out going, oh shit, I didn't finish the, the sequins. Um, so make the list of things need, that need doing, divide them up into months, and then further, if I can, I divide them into weeks. So what can I get done this week? And, and, and sometimes that I'll do a little closer to each month, like coming up, let's say I, I need the, the bodice finished by the end of the month. Okay, well, first week I know I need to have, you know, my, my lining done. Second week, maybe all my boning and facings and, you know, something like that. Okay, um, all right, if you have no deadline, back to this, you can do similar. Um, perhaps you don't need to break them down by months or weeks, but perhaps you want to make a list of all the steps that are going to go into the gown. That way, as you go, you can mark things off. And scratching things off a list is so motivating and so um, makes you feel good. And that can really help when you don't have a deadline because it's very easy to just let projects languish when you don't need them. And I know we are probably all experiencing that this year. Um, so my number one planning tip would be make a good mock-up. No matter how much time you're gonna devote to a gown and how beautiful the fabric is going to be and your embroidery, how perfect it will be. If it doesn't fit, it's so disappointing. So first things first, once you've got your plan, make your mock-ups and take your time and do it to the best of your ability. That way, not only will you have something to go off of, you will also have the exact pattern pieces. So when you go to embroider them, you can embroider the exact size pattern piece and you're not wasting time or material on extra, which is also why I do not recommend just embroidering garbage. Um, even an inch of embroidery takes time and it takes your material. So you definitely want skirts, you can kind of get away with doing yardage. Um, however, bodices and the like, sleeves and small pattern shapes that are kind of oddly shaped, you really want to, you don't want to waste your time embroidering beyond into the selvages. You want to stop right at the edge. Now, if you're working on one of these gowns for a long time, Fit can be a problem. Um, weight and size fluctuations can make a big difference in a year. Um, so some ways I've gotten around this, like with this gown, because I'm working on this, the skirt skirts right now, and um, not only do I not know exactly what size I'll be in a year whenever I finish this, um, for the bodice, I also wanted to make a different uh, pair of stays. So I've not patterned the bodice yet. I'm just doing the skirts. Um, you can take into account things like that. All right, so once you've got all of your planning sorted out, you have to actually do the thing. So doing. Finding the discipline to go through with some of these garments is hard. Um, it, it takes dedication and um, it's like it's like working out or learning a language or studying for anything really. It's not always gonna be fun, you're not always gonna be in the mood, but you if you've committed to going through with it, you, you gotta do it. And um, some things that I find help me to actually do it, um, set an alarm in your phone. Um, set aside a certain amount of time each day, just like if you do go to the gym. Um, setting an alarm in my phone also for when I'm, I need to end is very helpful because then whatever that amount of time is, I know I'm just stitching. I'm not worried about 
checking the clock. I'm not worried about where I have to be. If I have 20 minutes one morning, I set my timer for 20 minutes and I just sew. Um, speaking of sewing, um, use your sewing time wisely. I like to separate my sewing tasks into couch work and sewing room work. Um, sewing room work, patterning, machine sewing, um, fitting, anything big that really requires time in your sewing room. Um, even if um, my couch work is more fun, like maybe I'm more motivated to, to embroider for a while. Um, even if that's the case, if I have the time, if I have a good hour set aside where I can go in my sewing room, I use it for my sewing room tasks to prep work that can be done as my couch work. And my couch work is anything I can get done on the couch, like while hanging out with my husband, watching TV at night. This is also the type of work that I bring with when I travel, or if I know I'm gonna be stuck somewhere for a while, like um, I'm, I often, when I go in for like an oil change or car service, I'll bring something with me and do it while I wait. Uh, you may look kind of weird <laughs> embroidering in a, you know, body shop, but, um, if you, ha if you can snag an extra half an hour somewhere to, to get part of your project done, it's amazing how those little chunks of time add up. Um, even if you're not, if you feel uncomfortable bringing actual sewing when you have downtime uh, out and about, save that time for, you know, do your research, plan, do your sketching, do, um, you know, take that moment to study the pictures and bodice linings you saved to Pinterest. I mean, it's there's definitely things you can do in your downtime, um, even if it's just like five minutes waiting for, you know, your coffee at Starbucks or whatever. Um, these projects are very time consuming, and if you want to get them done in a timely manner, uh, take advantage of those little small, small moments that you don't have anything to do. Um, when I was working on this weaving, I, uh, it was during the holidays and so I had a little box loom and I was taking it around like when we'd go to like my family's house for dinner I would take it and in the evening um, you know after dinner we'd be playing a board game or whatever having a glass of wine and I would I would just weave it's not a lot of this stuff is not terribly mentally challenging so you can kind of zone out and keep doing the same thing and get some done when you're just sitting around instead of, you know, idly scrolling through your phone or what have you. So speaking of using your sewing time wisely, um, I like to have something on in the background when I work. I like to have, I prefer audiobooks, but TV, movies, I like to have some sound that kind of keeps my attention and I don't get bogged down by the monotony of like embroidering repeats. Um, but something I have noticed that I thought would be wise to pass on, when I listen to an audiobook or even music and I'm not looking up at the television, I get so much more done. Um, it's remarkable how much more I get done. And so that's why I've started setting a timer, um, like an alarm in my phone when I need to be done by and I prop on an audiobook and I just look at what I'm doing and I do it and I get much more done than when I'm watching television while I'm working. Even if it's something I've seen many times, it's amazing how often looking up it cuts into your it cuts out a good chunk of time. Um, also, and this is this is me personally, I if I do put TV on, sometimes I will turn my back to it. Like in my sewing room, my TV is kind of in, well, it's a computer, but it's kind of in an awkward spot. Um, so I can't sit and sew and look at it. My back is to it, the way my chair goes. And um, that way I can still hear what's going on. I can follow along, especially if it's something I've watched many times before. I get the, the joy of that without taking the time to get up and look. Um, I also try not to watch shows and movies that I have not seen before that way like I want to I want to get up and I want to see what's happening so I try to keep it to either audiobooks music or things I've seen a million times
And I just find that for me that that saves a lot of time on my sewing. Um, and watching or listening to stories um, set around the era perhaps that your gown is coming from, I find that very motivating. Um, it, you know, to, to hear um, maybe a biography about someone who lived then or have a show on that's set, you know, during the same era as your garment, I find that very motivating. And I think that is great uh, in keeping up morale and keeping up enthusiasm for a project. Um, speaking of motivation, um, it's tough to find it sometimes, especially with long-term projects, because they get boring. They get monotonous. Um, and it's especially true when you have no deadline. So some things that help me stay motivated. I like to make time for other small projects. Um, while keeping like up with my like weekly, monthly goals for my long-term garment, um, I'd like to add in little projects. They're very, they kind of satisfy that um, instant gratification thing and uh, help me feel like less like I'm, like I'm chained to a boring project. Um, if you don't have time or the inclination to work on other things while you're working on a long-term project, you can break up the monotony with other parts that you're going to need, like perhaps an accessory you're going to need down the way for your ensemble, or perhaps um, another part of the gown, like an underskirt or buttons that need doing. Um, also motivating, to help with motivation is um, I like to do like an inch a day. So this, this gown has been tough. Um, I started making it for a ball that was canceled and then I rescheduled it for something else and that got canceled. And then basically this whole year is canceled. So not having any deadline, I went to a complete standstill on this. Um, just zero drive to work on it, nothing. And the last couple of months went by and I really have no other sewing projects on right now. And I miss it, I miss sewing. Um, I miss having the motivation to sew. So I told myself like one inch a day would be better than nothing. So I started doing one inch a day and that kind of fed into me going, oh, I have time for this again, this is, this is good. So then I went, okay, instead of one inch, I'm gonna do one strip and these these metal strips are about two feet long and amazingly they only come out to about three or four inches of embroidery so then i started doing just that a day so in one week i kind of went from like here to I got that done then i got part of that and then around the corner and so by the end of the week i had finished a whole row um which really really excited me and it makes me want to work on this so much more so even just starting with like one inch a day. It, it's amazing how once you see the progress, it gets ya. Um, other motivating things, speaking of the one inch a day, if you take a picture before, before you work on it for an amount of time, and you do that every time, you can see the pictures, like how far you've come. You can also, uh, put a safety pin or a little thread tack when you start each day and you can see each day leave it there and you can see how far you've come it's very motivating to see progress also um, posting about your projects I I don't like to like secret squirrel my stuff I like to post about my projects because it keeps me accountable if I'm sharing my progress um, it keeps me wanting to share more. So it motivates me personally by sharing it with other costumers. And then also, you know, when you're getting a little down on a project, having other costumers cheer you on is so helpful. So speaking of posting and accountability and sharing your progress, I've come across a lot of people that prefer not to um, and they like to present a finished garment instead. 
as opposed to sharing the process. And I think a lot of times this comes from not wanting to share a failure um, and, and wanting to put your best foot forward. And that's, I mean, that's awesome. But um, if you do post about things and I've, I've started garments many times and not been able to finish them, then I've, I've shared them. Um, it's perfectly fine to change your plans. So this is a hobby. <laughs> it's a hobby. It's supposed to be fun. Um, and even if you've cruised through all the steps and you've planned perfectly and you know, you're well on your way and you have the motivation and you're doing it, life can get in the way. And I mean, this is a prime year of that. So when plans need to change, be okay with it. Be okay with postponing a project, changing a deadline, stopping for a while. If you've planned to the best of your ability, you can put these projects aside and they will be there when you're ready to get back to them. You know, if you don't feel like you can complete something by a certain event coming up, set it aside, do it for next year's event. Um, and this goes for, this goes for like mental health too. Like if these things are too just taxing on you and you just can't deal at the moment, put it aside. Like it'll be there for you. Um, and I think a lot of the time people continue on, especially if they've, they've shared progress on a, on a project, they continue on with it even though it's not making them happy because they want to, they feel accountable to finish it because they've, they've told the world that they're working on this project. I'm going to be honest with you, and I've, I've started many projects that I've had to postpone or stop. Nobody cares. Nobody brings it up. Nobody remembers. I mean, people have their own stuff going on. Um, and, and if somebody does give you shit about stopping a project or postponing it, like, who cares? Like, block and delete if it bothers you because it's not their thing. And this is supposed to be fun. It's supposed to be joyful. And when they stop being joyful, set it aside. We have way too much going on in the world and in everybody's actual lives to let something that is supposed to be fun derail you and bring you down. Um, and don't forget, you can always revisit these things. I started a gown, oh my god, like eight years ago. It was um, from the Metropolitan Museum. It was going to be a copy of this 1804 gown worn by a... Uh, Miss Patterson, who was married to Jerome bon Bonaparte, Napoleon's brother. Um, beautiful gown, I, I love it so much. And years ago, I started it, and um, I kind of had really no, no concept how to actually get through one of these gowns. So I just kind of, woo, let's just start. And I just kind of started embroidering, like totally winged it. And of course, because I had no planning and no, no, anything for this project it totally came to a standstill and it has been sitting with half of a front panel of embroidery done like somewhere in my sewing room for the last like decade um but i can always go back to it like i don't consider it like a failure in my book it's just it's in the ufo pile it's fine it's you, you can always go back to these things and if something isn't up to your standards as i said before about fit go back and change it like it's fine and if you really hate a project and you're halfway through and you're just like, I do not want to finish this, sell the material. Give away what you worked on already. Sell it if you can. You know, um, do your best to keep this fun. It's meant to be fun. Let's see. Another hard thing is perfectionism. I mean, what is, what is perfectionism anyway? Is it perfect fit, perfect stitches, perfect research. Like there's no such thing. Um, if you look at original garments, they're not perfect. They're a mess. 
And I'm, ha I'm having a hard time with, with this one, actually. I keep referring to this, this is my current beast. The embroidery material that I'm using is almost twice as thick as the original gown. And so to me, as I'm working on it, I'm thinking, oh, this looks so clumsy. Oh, it's so messy. Oh, I wish this was more perfect. Well, I'm also working on it from six inches away. And the original gown, I'm sure, was not made with perfect in mind. It was made with done in mind. Done is better than perfect. Don't waste your time spending three times as long on a project trying to make the stitches perfect. When you're chatting to somebody and the garment's done and you're wearing it and they're standing three feet away from you, no one is going to notice the stitch that you think is a little out of place. No one is going to notice. They're going to see a beautiful finished gown, you in it, happy because you're wearing it. Don't get hung up on the small things. Like, don't lose the forest for the trees. Get it done. And then look at it from a distance. I'm sure it's just fine. And speaking of perfect fit and perfect research, perfect fit, if you take your time on your mock-up, you can change the fit. Gowns can be altered. And down the way, if you make something and down the way you think it needs to fit better, take it apart and fit it better. Um, as for research, we learn new things every day. And so often when I've completed a garment, after I'm done with it, I learn something new on how I could have done it better. And I always try to look at these garments not as like your magnum opus, but as just another step on your sewing journey. Like this, when I finished this white dress, it was a big deal because it was the first really heavily embellished gown I did. And um, I was proud of it, but there was definitely places I saw room for improvement. Um, and then I learned about them later and it's just, it's just another step on the sewing journey. Like um, I had a big problem with the silk tool stretching under the weight of the sequins once I started constructing the gown. And after it was finished, I found out from um, Carolyn, um, her Instagram is at Modern Mantua Maker, um, she discovered that a lot of these beaded and sequined overlays were actually backed with um, a more stable fabric like chiffon or organza to prevent that exact thing. Now, on this, I can't really go back and do that. I mean, I guess, I don't know, maybe you could. Why would I want to? It's not that bad. But for future projects, you know what to improve upon. So um, try not to look at these things as such a big deal. Like, look at them as just another sewing project. You're learning new things. Maybe they take a bit more time. Um, but I think that definitely helps in regards to like your your sanity when dealing with these projects and not feeling like you haven't made it perfect enough. So a lot of things that help me feel motivated also help me with um, feeling impatient about a project. Um, tracking my progress really helps when I'm feeling impatient. Um, seeing those materials add up, seeing the time add up, you can track, you can you can record your time, how much you spend on each project. Um, but patience is hard because you can't really you can't really trick yourself into being patient. You can help yourself be more motivated, which helps with um, enthusiasm, which helps with patience. But um, patience is really something you kind of got to you kind of have to come to terms with yourself. Like it took a minute, but I've had to kind of come to terms with the fact that this gown may honestly take years um, if I continue working on it at such a slow pace and that's okay like I have nothing coming up that I need it for even if I do you know like when I finish it I can find an event like I, there's plenty of other things I have to wear so sometimes with these long-term projects you just have to come to term come to terms with just being okay with them taking a while all right, so 
little story time before I go because I want you I want you to know that everything I talked about today all the potential problems all the uh, hurdles to overcome um, changing of plans canceling plans um, stopping work on a dress that you've already started um, I want you to know I have personally been through all of them so these are not hypothetical um, I'm giving you my my experiences my my trials uh, to hopefully hopefully to learn from so where this has gotten so far this has a lot of that involved and um, if you don't follow me on Instagram or I haven't really shared a lot about this it's a recreation of a 1780s gown at the Metropolitan now I'll just give you some context now how it came to be at the point it is now so last year 2019 my my big project for the first half of the year was uh, this beaded gown and a whole 1920s wardrobe for a 1920s themed trip week-long trip to Egypt so that was my big goal my big my big sewing project for the year Wow, we went on the trip halfway through the year it was awesome but then I came home and I didn't really have something to work on I didn't have a big project and I really didn't have events lined up um, even if had the world not stopped this year um, I wasn't gonna be able to make it to costume college because of a scheduling conflict so I didn't have that as a goal um, so I came across accounts of this gown from Deadwood South Dakota that was it was black satin embroidered with colorful cattle brands and flowers um, and it was it wasn't explicit when it was from but I believe it was the 1870s so that, I just thought that was like so wacky and cool and I had to do it so I went and planned it out got all my materials I was ready to start it and I actually made some um, some budget concessions like um, the original dress was described as being black satin um, but after everything else that year I really couldn't afford black silk satin in that kind of yardage so I was able to find a silk cotton blend that um, read like a satin and was firm enough to embroider so went through with that was about to start and I just I heard about a ball that was around my birthday in March of 2020 there was an 18th century ball so as a birthday present to myself um, we were gonna go to that so I put the deadwood dress aside and went on to decide what I was gonna make for this well this gown I had want I've been wanting to make it for years and years and I said finally you know what let's do it this is perfect opportunity to start so finally got around to properly planning it um, I started embroidering so I, I had all the materials from years ago luckily um, started embroidering it and swiftly realized that there was just no way I was gonna be able to finish it in like six months um, I think I factored it out to like I would have had to embroider like eight hours a day to get it done and plus the dress making and there was just there's just no way in hell I was gonna do that <laughs> I'm just not possible so um, so I put that aside and I was gonna make something else for the ball well just about the same time that ball got canceled so being on this 18th century kick I rebooked a trip to Williamsburg instead and we were gonna go in May for the garden party um, so I got a couple extra months because my birthday was in March I was supposed to have it done by March got a couple extra months in there but then for going to Williamsburg I didn't want just one really fancy dress I wanted a whole weekend's worth of clothes to wear and enjoy so I put this aside and made like this pink gown and a few other gowns to wear and then the pandemic happened and so that trip got canceled so after a couple of months of loafing around and having zero motivation to do anything sewing related because of the world um, I recently repicked this back up 
because I had planned it nicely. It was still sitting there, ready to go. Um, and I've started working on it again because there's, I literally have no deadlines for anything right now. And it's, it's actually really, really, really nice to have something so mindless. Like I just get to sit down and I try to, I try to do a little bit every day now. Just go do my thing, set it aside. It's stress free because I have nowhere to wear it. And eventually one day I'll, I'll finish it and I'll wear something and it'll be great. So <clears throat> I actually ended up using some of the Deadwood dress materials, the satin specifically, to make a um, Poiret inspired, Downton Abbey inspired um, harem skirt ensemble for a little like Downton Abbey skit. So I got to reuse my material there. That story kind of illustrates how you gotta be okay with plans changing. You gotta, you gotta just deal. And the great thing about historical sewing, um, opposed to modern, none of these things are ever going out of style. If we put aside a project for five, 10 years and get back to it even, it's still old, no matter what. So you don't have to worry about fashions changing. Um, that is a that is a major benefit to costuming. These gowns, they were old when we start them and um, they'll be around as long as we want them to be. So I know this was a long one today. Um, thanks for sticking around if you've come this far. I hope it was helpful. I hope there were some, I hope I was able to help if you're looking to make a, a more ornate gown or even just uh, some little tidbits to help your everyday sewing, maybe be more organized, uh, maybe some new ideas on how to plan or how to uh, stay motivated and disciplined. Um, and if you have any questions, please leave them for me in the comments. I will do my best to get to them. And I also, uh, coming up, I will definitely do a tutorial on how I make my embroidery frames. Um, Cause they're, I, I think it's, a great option compared to purchasing. And somebody else in a comment asked me recently about, um, I mentioned tapes in gowns, so uh, I guess I can show you something real quick. Alrighty, I was asked, um, I mentioned hanging tapes in skirts, and there are many different ways to do this. But um, a very simple way, so it's hanging on the hanger. Is just to attach a tape to your waistband, and um, sometimes I do this. I whip it just along the crease. Or you can put it, this particular one is on the waistband. Oh, maybe you just can't really see, can you? But um, maybe I'll have to do a little video on different kind of waist tapes because I, um, I have a beautiful 1890s gown, uh, original gown, that has waist tapes that would just be very illustrative to share. So anyways, guys, thanks for, thanks for watching and um, yeah, share any questions and also uh, share if you have a gown that you would just love to recreate. I'd love to I'd love to know and that way we can all kind of ooh and ah over potential future gowns. Anyways, have a great day guys.